So the first thing I want to tell you is that today's talk is a little different, perhaps, than the talk that's usually given here in the Health Library in the sense that my goal is not just to educate you, um, though education you will receive. My goal is really to enlist you. And uh, I hope that people here watching and people who are watching online will come to see that really what I am here to do is to call you to service because the people who are suffering with the problem that we're going to be discussing today are people who are often misdiagnosed. And uh, I'm convinced that the, somebody here in this room knows somebody who is leaking. And when I say leaking, I'm talking about a cerebrospinal fluid leak. And what's clear to me is that most of the people who are leaking, who have cerebrospinal fluid leaks, don't know that they're leaking, and therefore they don't know the right kind of doctor to go to. And so uh, as I'm going through my talk and you start to hear about symptoms like tachycardia, fast heart rate, or uh, fatigue that gets worse when someone's upright, or neck pain or head pain that gets worse when someone's upright, if you're not, if you don't have those kinds of symptoms yourself, I would ask you to think about the other people who you know who have things that have been called maybe POTS or maybe chronic fatigue syndrome or maybe chronic daily migraines and think about sending them a link to this video so that they can see if the things that we talk about here today are things like what they're experiencing. So. Uh, I'm asking you not just to become educated about what you're interested in, but think about how you can participate in the work that we're doing here to find the people who are leaking so we can help those people. And this starts uh, with a story that comes from my own heart. Uh, this is my daughter, Alex. And uh, Alex is a special girl, and she's a special needs child of mine. And maybe three years ago, she started having unusual episodes where uh, she would become non-communicative and she would cry and ex express really great distress. And it would last for a week. And she wouldn't eat. And uh, she had urinary retention. And, um, uh, and they would recur and recur, and we were spending a lot of time in the hospital. And in fact, the last time I was here in this library giving a talk about neuropathic pain, when I look at that video, I think I look tired and I look uh, fatigued. And I think about where I was at that point, and we're doing much better now. And one of the things that happened during her evaluation is she had a, a spinal tap where someone put a needle in her spinal fluid to look at it. And we noticed at some point that there was a period of time when she was OK lying flat. And then she would get upright, and she would start screaming. And we don't think that all of what she had was a spinal fluid leak. But it seems that part of what she had was a spinal fluid leak. And she got what's called an epidural blood patch, and then did much better. And that got me reading about spinal fluid leaks and reading not a little bit, but a lot. And really thinking about where were these patients who had spinal fluid leaks? Where might they be misdiagnosed? Where might they be hiding here around Stanford? And that took us in some interesting directions. And I'm going to share that with you today. Because after I did all of that reading, of course, now we have cerebrospinal fluid leaks in the news with Steve Kerr, the coach of the Warriors, by report having a spinal fluid leak, which I will say for the record, I have not seen him. I know nothing about his medical problem. George Clooney has talked about, in public interviews, his struggling with a spinal fluid leak. Um, but really, the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today comes not only from that experience with my daughter, which got me reading a lot more about spinal fluid leaks, but a piece that was in the New York Times roughly a year ago. And this piece is, there's a section in the New York Times called the Well section. And they occasionally run a little, a little uh, piece called Think Like a Doctor. 
And this one was called Think Like a Doctor Swept Off Her Feet. And you can see it's dated February 11th. And uh, the challenge was, can you figure out what's wrong with a young woman with a headache that's lasted for months who becomes too dizzy to walk? And uh, I read about this young woman. And um, uh, it turns out that the, the case itself was written by Dr. Lisa Sanders. And it turns out Lisa Sanders is the inspiration for the actual Dr. House series. So she's an internist who, uh, who works at Yale. And so she wrote the piece in the New York Times. And uh, the case that she wrote about was a 21-year-old woman with a three-month history of intractable headaches, now complicated by severe dizziness and passing out upon standing. And this young woman uh, reported that her pain started after uh, a whiplash accident roughly three months before she was admitted to the hospital. Her headache was worse when she stood up. She was nauseated but did not vomit. Uh, and she reported that her headache seemed to start in her neck but was felt most strongly in the forehead. She had difficulty with thinking and concentration. Uh, and she had dizziness, but it was only present when she was upright, and it resolved completely when she was lying down. She also noted that her left ear felt stopped up. And because I had been reading and reading and reading about spinal fluid leaks, I read this and I thought, she must have a spinal fluid leak. And so I wrote in my little con contribution, because they invite contributions from doctors, and I wrote about why I thought it was a spinal fluid leak. And then, the next day, the beautiful thing is they put up the diagnosis, so you get to find out if you were right. And the diagnosis, in the things that led to the diagnosis, they reported that her head CT was normal, and it, a, a lumbar puncture was discussed a number of times, but it was never actually done, possibly because it was technically non-feasible because she'd had previous lumbar spine surgery which we should recognize in and of itself is kind of weird for a 26-year-old to have had previous lumbar spine surgery. Um, but they noted that her pulse was 74 when lying down, but when she stood up, her pulse went to 130. And this was reproduced in something called a tilt test where they lied her down on a table and they tilted her. And, uh, and the tachycardia led to a diagnosis by a full professor of neurology at Harvard Hospital at one of the Harvard hospitals, Beth Israel in Boston, and she was diagnosed with POTS, not a CSF leak. She was diagnosed with postural tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. And I was bothered by this, because I thought she had really described well uh, a spinal fluid leak. And um, what's interesting is when you've got POTS, while there's some treatment, what they talk about is really that what this patient had to do was learn to cope with her symptoms. Over the years since this patient's diagnosis was made, she's learned a few tricks to accommodate her invisible disability. She eats lots of salt, which keeps her blood vessels as full as possible. The idea is with POTS, unlike a spinal fluid leak, the problem is your blood vessels aren't constricting enough when you stand up. And so you're not getting enough blood to your head. And so the conception of POTS is not that there's a, some kind of leaking fluid from your spinal canal. The concept with POTS is that the autonomic nervous system, which is supposed to tell the blood vessels to constrict, um, isn't working right, either because of genetic factors, in some cases autoimmune factors, in many cases, you know, there's not even a mechanism postulated. But the thought is, is that it's basically a disease of the autonomic nervous system. And the, uh, the thing that I kind of didn't like about that was that this young woman also had a history of joint problems in her temporomandibular joint. She had scoliosis, and she'd had the spine surgery 18 months ago, and then a reoperation three months later. But we'll, we'll come back to that, why that would be important. So let me give you a little bit of an anatomy lesson that'll help you understand the distinction between POTS and the other thing, which is the main part of our conversation today, which is a cerebrospinal fluid leak. Because what I'm going to tell you 
is that I think that Dr. House and Dr. Freeman actually got the diagnosis wrong. I think their patient has a spinal fluid leak, and I'm going to tell you why, and why those other things like the scoliosis and the temporomandibular joint pain and the previous back surgery might actually be important. And to do that, I first have to teach you a little bit about how our bodies are put together. So this first image here is an image of a dissection of the back of someone's uh, neck. And what you see is, is they've taken off the skin, and they've taken off the superficial muscles, and they've even taken off the bones that surround the spinal canal. And inside the spinal canal, what you find here is both the spinal cord and surrounding the spinal cord, which has been cut away right here, is this bag, this surrounding tissue that surrounds the spinal cord here that's called the dura. And the dura extends all the way from the base of the skull up here down to the tailbone. And inside that dura, there's normally spinal fluid that bathes and surrounds the spinal cord and the brain. And uh, the thought is that the brain is basically floating in this fluid, and it acts in some ways to mechanically protect uh, the brain, and it serves some other functions in terms of allowing metabolites to get to and from the neural tissue. And I've blown it up here so that you can see it a little bigger. Again, the spinal cord here and the dura cut there so you can see inside this bag of fluid. Okay? When people talk about a cerebral spinal fluid leak or a dural tear or a dural leak, they're talking about a tear in this. This is what it looks like if what you do is you cut across here instead of cutting across the back of me. So if you take a straight cut across here, you see the spinal cord, some nerve roots coming out, surrounded by this bag of fluid here. And what you'll see is also not only do the nerve roots come out, but as they leave the bag of fluid, they have to poke through the bag of fluid. So they have to, in order for the nerves to get out and become these nerves, they have to poke through the bag of fluid. And they have to create a defect in that bag of fluid. And not only do they create a defect in that bag of fluid, but the bag of fluid then invests and surrounds those nerves so that what you see out here is much thicker than the little nerve strands while they're in the bag of fluid itself. This is another image of what that dura looks like. And yet another image. And you can see this, the, the bag here, the dura, really has some substance to it. It really has some, uh, some thickness to it. And it's, it has to be watertight. Because if it's not watertight, and I have a column of fluid from here to here, there's no valves in there. So the, at the bottom of the sac, it's seeing three feet of water pressure. It's got to hold that pressure in. It's got to hold that fluid in. So the question is, what causes people to leak? And there's really three things, and they're illustrated on this slide. The first thing that causes people to leak is when their connective tissue is not quite right. Here's a patient of mine who came in complaining. Actually, she had been diagnosed with POTS. And the same thing that Dr. Sanders and Dr. Freeman's patient was diagnosed. And um, she had headaches like their patient that was uh, a big part of the symptom complex. But she had really flexible joints and skin. And it turns out that if you have connective tissue that's extra stretchy and flexible here, then the bag of fluid that holds your fluid in is thinner and more susceptible to having a tear or a leak. So one thing that wound up important in evaluating this young woman's headache was looking at her hands and her flexibility. Her connective tissue was not quite right. The second thing that can cause someone to have a spinal fluid leak is when some calcified bony thing is poking into that bag of fluid. So this image comes from a CT myelogram of a patient of mine who um, had the worst headache of her life, started smelling a bad 
odor in her nose every day. The headache was worse and worse as the day went on and she was upright with prolonged upright activity. And uh, finally, she had a full on seizure once as well. And so she had these debilitating headaches, this funny smell, and nobody could figure out what it was. And we went looking for a spinal fluid leak and what we found was this calcified, uh, she had a bulging disc in her thoracic spine and it had calcified in this funny way where it kind of pokes right through the dura to the spinal cord. Here's the spinal cord and this is in a CT myelogram. We inject contrast into the spinal fluid and you see it surrounding the spinal cord here. And so what you see is that, that calcified spike driving right through that. And we've seen that in a number of other patients. We'll go into that more. And the third thing that often causes people to leak is a doctor messing around, doing things to their spine, whether that's some surgeon trying to help Steve Kerr, or it's a doctor trying to do a lumbar puncture, or someone trying to alleviate pain with something like an epidural, accidentally getting just a little further and getting into the spinal fluid. And so if you know someone who's had an epidural or a spinal tap or has significant degenerative disc disease at multiple levels where one of those discs might have calcified, or you know someone whose connective tissue isn't quite right, these are the kind of people who need to be seeing this video. And when I say their connective tissue isn't right or isn't quite right, what does it look like? So here's a CT myelogram again, but instead of cutting across, we're cutting up and down. And what you see here is the spinal cord in the middle, and here's the bones that make up the spinal canal on either side. The white stuff here is contrast in the spinal fluid, and I've blown up this section here on this image here so that we can get a look at what's different here what do we see here that we don't see down here or down here? What we see here, these kind of lobulated structures that have the contrast in them. The contrast is no longer confined just in the bag of fluid. It's starting to get into these nerve root sleeves and these dilated uh, bulbous looking structures. That is essentially an aneurysm. It's an aneurysm of the bag of fluid. It is an aneurysm of the thecal sac. And what we call that, sometimes they'll call it a meningeal diverticula, sometimes you'll call it a dilated nerve root sleeve, sometimes they'll call it um, a perineural cyst, but what it really is, it's not a cyst in the way that most people think of a cyst. This is an aneurysm, a little ballooning outpouching that's formed where the nerve has to poke through the bag of fluid. Remember I told you that nerve had to poke through the bag of fluid and it creates a little weakness? That is what happens when that weakness causes a defect that grows and grows and grows. And like a balloon getting blown up, it gets thinner and thinner. And eventually, it can do what you would imagine. Especially, imagine you've got one of these things and you get in a whiplash accident and your head jerks back and forth. Well, this isn't in the neck. This is down on the thoracic spine. But imagine that happens. And imagine the seatbelt hits you hard and uh, compresses uh, your abdominal contents, and you get a pressure wave going through your spinal fluid. And that pressure wave hits one of these things, and poof. Now you've got a spinal fluid leak. And people are wondering why you're having all these headaches and neck pains after a car accident. They don't go looking down in your lower back. And this is what it looks like when somebody operates on it. So here what you see is the spinal cord's running along up here, and it's a little hard to see on this television, but uh, where the nerve root is coming out here, you have this lobulated uh, aneurysm coming off another kind of lobulated aneurysm that had developed a tear across it. So here's other people who we've seen just in the last six months whose connective tissue, again, you get the sense that their connective tissue isn't right. So here's somebody's bag of fluid with contrast in it. And then you see here at the bottom, it trails off the way it's supposed to. But then there's this other thing 
that's not supposed to be here, filling with contrast, with kind of poorly defined borders. And I've blown it up over here so that you can see there's, this has actually been connected. And where a nerve root is supposed to come off down here, the, uh, they've developed this kind of aneurysmal dilatation at the bottom of their uh, thecal sac. And not only that, but their little aneurysmal dilatation has developed an aneurysmal dilatation. All right? And that has three feet of water standing on top of it. What happens when this guy coughs? So how do you know your connective tissue isn't right? If you're watching this video and you've got chronic headaches and you've got chronic neck pain and you've got nausea and you've got vomiting, how do you know when your connective tissue isn't right? Um, people are often hyperflexible. They're often double jointed. They're often finding that when they're kids, especially, they're more flexible than the other kids in gymnastics or they're better able to do the poses in ballet. And, um, and they also notice that they bruise all the time. And they don't know why they're bruising all the time. They can't even remember what they bumped into in their bruising. Um, sometimes they're frankly double jointed. Sometimes wounds have a hard time healing. We've seen a couple of people with this problem who've had early cataracts. It's not unusual to have a cataract when you're 65. It's not unusual to have a cataract when you're 70. But it's really unusual to have a cataract when you're 40 unless you've had some direct eye trauma. But when you see someone who's in their 40s or is in their 50s and they've had bilateral cataracts, something's not right with their connective tissue. And if that person also is complaining of feeling worse in some way late in the day or when they're upright, that's someone who might be leaking. This person who's hyperflexible, when you look at them and you may think that what they're doing is beautiful, that's not normal. Not only is it not normal, you can't do that if you've got normal genes. Something's different about the way she's put together. And that, that makes her able to do certain things, but it makes her prone to other things, like a spinal fluid leak. The other thing that you'll find is many people who have connective tissue differences are rather tall. And if they're not tall themselves, they've got someone who's over 6'2 in their, in their direct family. They've got a brother who's 6'3 or a sister who's uh, 6 feet tall or their father's 6'4. When you see someone who's unusually tall, and for me, that means taller than me. If I'm 6'2 and I see someone who's taller than me, they're unusually tall. Someone who's unusually tall, who's complaining of headaches or weird neurologic symptoms should be evaluated for a leak. All right, how, again, how do you know your connective tissue isn't right? So here's what a CT myelogram should look like in someone whose connective tissue is right. See how they have these nice discs in between the, each bone, and there's some nice space. It's kind of uniform. There's nothing bulging out into the bag of fluid here. Um, that's a good, healthy spine. This is what it looks like when someone has bad connective tissue and they haven't been dropped. You know, you can have a spine that looks like this if you've been dropped out of a third story window, or you can have a spine like this when your spine just isn't built with the same strength that other people's spine is. And when your spine doesn't have the same strength. It's because the connective tissue is not the same. It's not right. It's not normal. You shouldn't have a bad disc here and there and there and there and there and even up into the thoracic spine with bulges at multiple sites. That's not normal. That individual also had a carotid dissection. This is a problem where the blood actually shears along the wall of the carotid artery. Again, not normal, and a sign that the connective tissue itself is not as strong as it should be. When someone like that has uh, nausea that's worse late in the day every day, or headaches that are worse late in the day every day, someone should be thinking about a leak. Somebody who has multi-level degenerative disc disease in their neck, and their thoracic spine, their lumbar spine, Yes, their spine is bad, but it also tells you something about their genes. And understanding the connection between that and a syndrome that makes people feel worse when they're upright is a critical understanding. 
you know your connective tissue isn't right if you have an abnormal heart valve. People with connective tissue problems will have mitral valve prolapse, they'll have aortic bicuspid valves, they'll have aortas, the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart, will become dilated and you'll get an aortic aneurysm, or you can have an aneurysm in some other blood vessel. And sometimes, again, you can get that kind of problem that we call a dissection, where the blood starts to carve into the wall and spread along it. So that's how you know if your connective tissue isn't right. Let's talk about other things. So this is further images of the person who I told you where you've got the calcium spike poking in towards their spinal cord with the, the contrast in the spinal fluid here. And what you see is just above and just below this, when you see this kind of calcium spike coming into the CT myelogram, and then you see this little contrast that looks almost like it's spreading along the nerve root at the level above and the level below, it's kind of faint. It doesn't pop out and catch your eye. But that constellation where you see something poking at the dura, and above and below it, you see unusual spread of the contrast, and you don't see it at other levels, that tells you there's a problem. And you won't see that on an MRI. This is what that person's MRI looked like. Here, very clear calcium spike coming in, touching the cord. We all kind of worship at the temple of the MRI. And what you see here is this person's MRI was read as basically kind of normal. There's a bulging disc in the thoracic spine. Nothing that would explain someone having terrible headaches and awful smells every day. And that's what it looked like when you cut down on the MRI. And I've blown up that one disc to look at it here. And again, you wouldn't think much of that. And the reason I show you the images, someone out there is going to watch this video, and they're going to think about the fact that they're having nausea every day, and it's worse late in the day, where they're going to be thinking about how they have a headache every day late in the day, and how it's kind of gone when they first wake up in the morning. And no one's been able to explain it. And they're going to have got, maybe someone even thought of a leak. And they got an MRI to look for it. And they thought that would be a good way to look for it. But it's not. It missed it on that patient I just showed you about. So bone spurs cause leaks. All right. Here's someone else who walked in uh, complaining. Interestingly, he didn't have a headache. What he had was uh, confusion. He would get more and more confused the longer he was upright. And then he'd lie down for a half hour, and he'd be fine. And he'd get up and try and work again. And after a couple hours, he'd be disoriented and start being confused. He wasn't sure how to get where he was going. He couldn't remember things. Um, and this is what the CT myelogram, again, the test where they stick contrast into the spinal fluid and do the CT scan. It showed this little bony ridge here. One of his discs had bulged, just like the previous woman. And it had calcified right where it's kind of poking in at the bag of fluid. And I've blown that up here so you can see it better. All right, so we were suspicious. Because when you hear about symptoms that are worse when someone's upright, even if they're neurologic weirdness, which is really what he was describing, and it's worse the longer someone's upright. You should be thinking about a spinal fluid leak. And when you see something's calcified that's poking towards the bag of fluid, you've got to go after that. And this is what it looked like on the axial cuts, where you cut across this way. And what you see is, again, this nubbin of calcium poking right in all the way to the cord itself, through the bag of fluid, which is here. And just like in that other patient, you see the contrast kind of spreading off along the nerve root here. So it's, again, the constellation not just of the bony osteophyte, which is what we call these things, poking towards the bag of fluid. It's the bony osteophyte poking toward the bag of fluid with contrast spreading along the nerve root in a patient who's saying, I'm worse as the day goes on. I'm worse the longer I'm upright. I'm worse when I'm doing things where I'm exerting myself or I'm dehydrated, other things that lower spinal fluid pressure. That's someone who has 
And this is the critical thing. That's someone who has a fixable problem. And that's really the amazing thing. And why I'm calling you to join me in helping to find people who have this problem. It's awful when someone has a condition like POTS where they're debilitated and every day is a struggle to get through and the struggle the longer you're upright. But it's an even bigger tragedy when what they really have is something that can be fixed, right? Because what was that other woman being given? She was being given instructions on how to cope. And don't get me wrong, helping people to cope is important. But you've got to look for the things you can fix. Somebody else who walked in uh, complaining of uh, POTS. They thought she had POTS. And uh, they even thought she had something called a Chiari malformation, where her skull supposedly wasn't big enough in the back part. Uh, and so they thought it was compressing her brainstem. And she had a surgery to open up her skull base. And only later did we find this bone spur poking in at the bag of fluid. And if you look really hard, what do you see here? You don't just see the bone spur. What's this? It's a little different, right? A little bit of contrast here, over here. But it's subtle. You have to really look for it, and you have to look hard. And you got to know what you're looking for. So here's the third way. So now we've talked about two ways that you can have a spinal fluid leak. One, your connective tissue isn't right. Two. There's a bone somewhere poking at that spinal fluid. And you can't see the bone really well on an MRI, but you can see those bone spurs clear as day on a CT myelogram. And here's the third way. Some well-meaning doctor tries to help you with surgery or with a needle for something like an epidural steroid injection, and they accidentally get into the bag of fluid. And this is somebody looking on an x-ray camera. Uh, that accidentally injected into the bag of fluid because that bag of fluid can follow the nerve root out for a couple of, of uh, millimeters. Now, here's where it gets complicated. And this is why people are kind of poorly served by the medical system with this problem and why someone like me needs your help to find the people who are leaking. And it's because most doctors think they know about this problem, but what they know about is actually wrong. OK? Maybe that's overstated. What they know about it is true of a related problem that's different. OK? So in, uh, in the late uh, 19th century, in about 1880, they started doing spinal anesthetics, where they would inject, con uh, inject local anesthetic into the spinal fluid. And this was a great advance for certain kinds of surgeries. Um, but what they discovered very shortly after discovering spinal anesthesia was that when you stick a needle in somebody's back, the next day they often have something called a spinal headache, okay, which is from the CSF leak that's created by the puncture of the needle hole. Now, what's important is when you have a post-puncture headache, which is a kind of CSF leak, it has a well-defined onset that was just yesterday or last week. So number one, those people present in the acute phase. They don't present when they've been leaking a long time. And it turns out in this condition, symptoms change. When you leak for a little while versus leaking on and on and on, when you're first leaking, when you lie down, you feel much better. When you get up, you feel awful. When you've been leaking a long time, everything up there is a little bit inflamed and a little bit not behaving right. So when you lie down, you don't feel better right away. It takes a long time lying down to feel better when you've been leaking a long time. But most people, most physicians, are so familiar with the post-dural puncture headache that happens when they stick a needle into someone and cause a leak, they know those people, you lie them down, they feel fine. Stand them up, they feel awful. So when they see, if they even think about a spinal fluid leak, they think, oh, I can test for that. I'll just have them lie down in the office. And if they, said if they say their head still hurts, 
then they don't have a spinal fluid leak. But that's not true. It's more subtle. And that's why I was talking earlier about the people who have chronic leaks. It's not that they lie down and feel fine. It's that in the morning, when they've been lying down all night, they feel better. Maybe not totally perfect, but better. And as the day goes on, with them being upright longer and longer, they start feeling worse. So we have something called a postdural puncture headache, which is what happens when you stick a needle in someone. Those people have a single leak. You only poked them in one place. We know that 30 to 40% of people who are leaking spontaneously, 30 to 40% of them are leaking at multiple sites. Why? Because their connective tissue isn't right. So it doesn't just affect one site. Often they're leaking somewhere else. And maybe they don't present when they're first leaking. They're going along leaking, and they're kind of compensating. And then they fall on the stairs, and they start leaking from a second site. Now they can't compensate. They can't make spinal fluid fast enough. So by the time they present needing help, they're leaking from more than one place. Postural puncture headache, single leak, spontaneous leak, maybe multi-site. Postural puncture headache, this orthostatic headache. Orthostatic is a fancy medical word for saying that it's there when you're upright and it's not there when you're flat. These people have an orthostatic headache. These people, not so much an orthostatic headache, but a late day headache, an exertional headache. And the non-orthostatic, meaning it's, it's not necessarily uh, controlled by their posture, but they've got a chronic daily headache. These people, the people who've just had a needle stuck in them, 90% of those people are fixed with one epidural blood patch. We'll talk about what that is. But it's basically when you inject blood outside the bag of fluid to try and clot off the hole. 90% response to just one epidural blood patch for someone who's got a postural puncture headache. Only a 30% chance of responding to that first epidural blood patch when you're leaking spontaneously. Why? I showed you that picture where there was a big long line where that nerve root sleeve had ruptured, right? It's not, just a, uh, it's not just a point defect. It's a defect that has length and conformation that is irregular. It's harder to close. The natural history of a postural puncture headache is well understood and well described. Most of these things will heal on their own. Some will require an epidural blood patch. These are mostly benign. Very few people have chronic problems from them, although it's well documented that some people do have chronic problems from these. For some people, these don't heal on their own. And for some people, even a, a single epidural blood patch is not enough. So somebody who says, I was fine, and then I had a, uh, an epidural for my child, and they accidentally got into the bag of fluid, and ever since then, I've had headaches, that's real. The natural history of spontaneous leaks are poorly understood. We don't know how many people who have spontaneous leaks get better. When a bone spur pokes through that bag of fluid, how many people can seal over that, that bone spur and just incorporate it into the wall of their bag of fluid? We don't know the answer to that question. What we know is that these people are marked by chronic disability. They are suffering and suffering and suffering, and it goes on and on. These are rarely mysterious. These are often mysterious. Young women are most at risk for this. It appears that women are also more at risk for this. These are fixable. These are also fixable, which is why I'm here giving you a lecture today and asking you to help me find the other people who are leaking. Because they're out there and they're suffering. And a system, we have a medical system that is designed for you to come in and describe your symptoms and get referred to the appropriate uh, expert in that field and then get a, a correct diagnosis and correct treatment. But when you have something that's pretty infrequent and presents with symptoms that are so common to other things, neck ache, headache, nausea, fatigue, these are things that the medical system if you have a treatable cause with some structural problem, like I've shown you, and it's causing those symptoms, the likelihood of the medical system arising 
arriving at the correct diagnosis is low. And so people who have some expertise and some knowledge about this have some kind of fundamental responsibility to go out and look for these people. And now that you know, I want you to join me and take on the mantle of that responsibility in trying to find some of these people. Because in six months, in six months since I started reading about this, we have found 26 people like this at Stanford. And if we found that many people, it can't be that rare. If we found that many people, you either know someone who has a leak or you know someone who knows someone who has a leak. And you should be trying to figure out who that is. And so if you're watching this online, I'm asking you to take two minutes right now and send a link to this video to two or three people who you think have some chronic ailment that might, just might, be related to this. Just take two minutes. Don't try to make it perfect. Don't try to research everything about this before you send it. Just do what you can do in two minutes. So the symptoms of a leak. We talked about headache, maybe orthostatic, nausea and or vomiting, ringing in the ears. People who are leaking, something like 70 or 80% of them report that they have ringing in their ears. If you know someone who has chronic ringing in their ears who also is abnormally tall, or has abnormal flexibility, you should be putting the two and two together. It's something to think about and pursue. Neck pain and stiffness, neurologic weirdness we talked about, you know, people who are getting uh, disoriented after being upright for too long, I mean, that's really bizarre. And fatigue, the people we've been finding and helping with this problem have been talking to us about the fatigue that they had that now is better. So I like this. This is the headache. And I like it because she's actually lying down, which is what these people do to try and get better. The vomiting, the ringing in the ears, the neck pain, and feeling like they're unplugged, both in terms of the neurologic sense of they feel somehow separated from their environment, uh, and also feeling like they're all out of energy. They're fatigued. I had a woman earlier this week who we think is leaking uh, who described that sometimes if she's been up too long, she can, for instance, be driving on her way home and she gets disoriented and isn't quite sure how to get home. She'll be on the highway and suddenly she doesn't know what exit she's supposed to take. The MRI findings that you can see in people who are leaking are well described. And when you take, if you have an intact skull, what that means is if you drain one thing out of this skull and the skull stays intact, the volume has to get made up by something else. And so if you suck fluid out of here, because this is normally a fluid filled space and this is normally a fluid filled space, if you suck fluid out of here because you're leaking, the changes you get look like this. The ventricles, which have fluid, become a little more small. And the, the cisterns, the big fluid-filled spaces that surround the, the nooks and crannies of the brain, have less fluid in them. This thing called the optic chiasm often becomes flattened and, in fact, can bend over the pituitary gland, which itself becomes bigger. The pituitary gland is like a great big vein. And uh, when the pressure surrounding it gets low, the vein expands. And when the pressure around it gets high, it collapses. And so one of the bellwethers of what's happening to the pressure in your head is the pituitary gland. People with intracranial hypertension, too much pressure in their head, can often wind up with a syndrome that's called an empty cella syndrome or a partially empty cella syndrome, which is a fancy way of saying their pituitary is collapsed. And people who have Low pressure have very robust, sometimes what we call hyperemic pituitaries, where they're real bright on the MRI. Sometimes they're enlarged. And so here's someone who is leaking. And so their ventricles are a little bit small. There's not as much space there. The pituitary is a little bit large. 
and they have this thing called pachymeningeal enhancement, where they have this arc of bright tissue over the surface of the brain. In contrast, this is them after they've been patched. The ventricle's just a little bit bigger. That pachymeningeal enhancement went away. The pituitary got smaller. And this is uh, what you see when you're looking not front on, but down the side, what's called the sagittal view. And what you see is when someone has a leak, which is over here, the fluid in front of this part of the brainstem called the pons is reduced. And the fluid up here is reduced. And you can actually see the cerebellar tonsils, which are these things, start to kind of come down and poke their way out of the skull. When there's a normal amount of fluid, the cerebellar tonsils stay up here. The fluid in the prepontine cistern, which is the fancy way of saying the fluid in front of the pons here, should be more robust. And there should be more fluid around here. Similarly, the pituitary gland here should be a little bit smaller than the pituitary gland here. And in real life, what it looks like is like this. So here's someone who presented with a leak, not one of my patients, a published patient. And what you see is, is this whole bottom part of the brain looks like it's been kind of compressed into the bottom part of the skull. So we call that sagging. And the pons has become very flat. And the tonsils have become uh, so that they're poking out there. That is a classic appearance for a cerebrospinal fluid leak. But what I want to tell you is that we have been finding that a lot of the people who have a headache that can be fixed with an epidural blood patch have MRIs that are much more normal than that. And so one of the most dangerous things that can happen to someone who's got a spinal fluid leak is they get an MRI that's read as normal. And often, they're much more normal than these. These are MRIs of people who are really uh, extreme leakers. And it's clear that most, most people are not extreme leakers. This is the MRI of someone who we fixed with an epidural blood patch. This MRI was read by a Stanford neuroradiologist who is a world-class radiologist as normal. Now, the truth is, is it doesn't show the things that this MRI shows, right? There's a lot more fluid in the fourth ventricle here than there is here. There's a lot more fluid here than there is here. But for this young woman, there wasn't as much fluid here as she needed. And she was someone who had been diagnosed with POTS and who subsequently got an epidural blood patch and then two more and then went back to work and stopped being on disability. And this is what the published CT myelograms showing a leak show. They show a cord here, contrast around it in the thecal sac, some coming out here. Often, if they're profound leaks, they're way out here. But again, a lot of leaks may be more subtle than that. This is what a spinal fluid leak is supposed to look like. But the truth is, is if you have a leak where it's not obvious that there's some kind of contrast here outside a well-defined fecal sac, do you send in your subtle picture to a journal? The journal may not take it because, in fact, they may say, I'm not sure that shows a leak. So what they do is you send in your things that are obvious to the journals, and everyone becomes educated about the obvious leaks, but not the subtle leaks. Here's another thing of what the leak is supposed to look like, and another, and another. But this is one of the people who we fixed with an epidural blood patch. It really doesn't look like this at all, or this. You could say it kind of looks like this published image, where you've got the cord and the bag of fluid, and it kind of trailing out along the nerve root here, right? So here's a CT myelogram, again read by a world-class neuroradiologist as normal. Because they said, well, you know, sometimes you can see this. Sometimes you can see this. 
And that's the most disturbing thing at all, at, uh, of all, because I think when they say sometimes you just see this, I think you're just seeing this because more people are leaking than we realize. Labs, what kind of labs can you do to help confirm or contribute to the diagnosis that someone's leaking? Well, there's a couple things. One is that if you're leaking and your brain is actually having just a little bit of traction on it, this thing here, which is the pituitary gland, is connected to the rest of the brain by a real thin stalk here. And if there's just a little bit of traction on that stalk, the brain stops telling the pituitary gland what to do. And you get a particular kind of syndrome called hypothalamic pituitary dissociation, which is a fancy way of saying the brain ain't telling the pituitary what to do anymore. And interestingly, when you stop telling the pituitary gland what to do, most of the things the brain tells the pituitary what to do are positive things. It tells the pituitary, make, th make thyroid releasing hormone to tell the thyroids to make more thyroid hormone, or make uh, corticotropin releasing hormone to tell the adrenal glands to make more uh, cortisone. But one of the things that it tells the pituitary to do, it's telling the pituitary not to do. It's telling the pituitary, don't make prolactin. The brain is normally telling the pituitary, don't make prolactin, because that's a hormone that you only need made when you're breastfeeding a baby. And so when this, this stalk gets disrupted because someone's leaking, sometimes those people have an elevated prolactin. And over the last six months, as we've been looking at people who are potentially leaking, roughly one in five have an elevated prolactin. The other thing is, is again, if you drop the pressure in the head, because there's all these different veins in the skull, if you drop the pressure in them, in the, inside the skull, now the veins expand because there's a big pressure gradient between the normal pressure inside the vein and the reduced pressure inside the skull. And as those veins expand, they actually start to have some fluid from the veins kind of seep across the veins into the spinal fluid. And when that happens, people's spinal fluid has just a little more protein in it than it's supposed to. And so uh, every person who we send for a CT myelogram now not only do they get their CT myelogram and have the contrast injected into their spinal fluid, but before we do that, we do two things. We measure an opening pressure. We actually measure the pressure in the spinal fluid. And we send some of that spinal fluid to the lab to have them look for elevated protein. And so far, the elevated protein has been the most consistent, objective thing that suggests to us that we're really on the right path and that they're leaking. Treatment, what can you do for these people? So there's something called an epidural blood patch. And an epidural blood patch starts with getting blood sterile. Okay? So here's someone who's about to undergo an epidural blood patch, and their arm is getting prepped the way you would normally prep a surgical site. You gotta do this very sterile. And then after we prep out the arm, we go ahead and we put an IV in one of the big veins. And we attach that IV to some tubing. And the beautiful thing about attaching it to that tubing is now you can just put an opsite or a Band-Aid over that. You don't have to worry about the sterility of that anymore. You cover that up. Now you've just got to keep the other end of the tubing sterile, which means now you can turn this patient over and start working on putting your needles into their back, and you'll still be able to get sterile blood from them. So what we do is we then hand off that tubing to someone else who takes it and keeps the end of it, which has a syringe on it, sterile. And now they're lying face down. That syringe is going to get put on that table to wait. And now that they're face down, they start to have a needle put in their back. And the needle is getting put in their back in this funny way where you have a syringe attached to the back of the needle. And what he's doing with his finger here is he's actually putting a little bit of pressure on the air in here. And it turns out as he's putting that needle through the ligaments in the back, he's kind of coming in from the skin here, 
And he's not going to be able to push a lot of air through that needle as he's coming through these ligaments. And then when he pops through that last ligament into this space, which is labeled number four, suddenly the air is going to go easily. And he's going to know he's in the epidural space. So what this image is showing you here is the spinal cord is here, number five. And the bag of fluid we're seeing edge on here, that's number three. The spinal fluid is inside the bag of fluid. The epidural space is out here in number four, outside the bag of fluid. Okay, And you could see how if you had a tear here, injecting blood in this space so it could clot over that tear might be exactly the thing that the doctor ordered. That's a little schematic of the same thing I just showed you. And so once the needle's in place, you come back to that tubing. You suck all the fluid out of the tubing until you're getting blood back. You aspirate that blood into another syringe here. Fill it up. Give it back to your colleague who's just put the needle in the epidural space. And now all that blood gets injected back into the epidural space where you think they're leaking. And you can see it spreading here, that dark line, as we've mixed some contrast with the blood. And this is what it looks like on a CT scan. And this is where you can see how you might have some challenges. Okay, Here's a CT myelogram, again, the thoracic spinal cord. You've got the bag of fluid surrounding it. Remember that osteophyte that was poking through the front surface on that other, other image I showed you? Here's the epidural blood patch. You could see how that might have a hard time making its way all the way around to get to there when this is how much blood they put in, right? So sometimes you have to do higher volume blood patches. Sometimes you've got to do fancy things like put the needle in from the side here to get it to the front, what's called a transforaminal approach. Here's where they tried to do that for a patient, where they took a needle in here and they injected something called fibrin sealant. So this is what we do when someone's blood patch doesn't work. So if the blood's not enough to fix the problem, they may inject some fibrin glue in there to try and fix the problem. And that seems to work for some people whose epidural blood patches don't work. And we tried that for this patient with the calcium spike, with our neurosurgical colleagues in the cath lab, we came in from the side, put a needle in like this, and we injected some glue. And that glue is here spreading around like this, this darker area, spreading around, getting narrower and narrower and narrower, and coming to the base of that spike. And you know what? It did not work. And so she didn't get better from an epidural blood patch, and she didn't get better from the lateral placement of some fibrin glue. And so she went on to get surgery. Okay, And this is an image of someone else, not the same person, getting surgery, where these are actual metal clips now that have gone in to clip off some of those aneurysmal dilations. So who were these images today? So this MRI that was read as normal, who had this CT myelogram that was read as normal, who also had this on her CT myelogram that was read as a variant of normal, this is what she looks like today after her epidural blood patch. She went from being essentially disabled and on disability to working full time and uh, actually hiking and climbing. And she's in the back of the room today. And this bone spur that was causing a spinal fluid leak that was read as not showing a definite leak. And this was read as not showing a spinal fluid leak. And this MRI was read as normal. After an epidural blood patch, this is what he looks like. He's gone from being 
This is the gentleman who was disoriented uh, when he was up for too long. He's gone back to working full time. And about a month after we did his epidural blood patch, he sent us this image because he works as a gamekeeper in South Africa. And there he is with a lion walking and doing his job again. The big clue for him, despite his normal, normal MRI and CT myelogram, was that he was six foot six. So he was six foot six and complaining of the fact that the longer he was upright, the more confused he got. And that told me to go look for a leak. And this, with the bone spur poking in with some contrast, she's the woman who had previously had her whole skull opened up to relieve a Chiari malformation, one of the common misdiagnoses when people are actually leaking. After we patched her, well, there was her MRI, which was read as normal and not showing any leak. And that's what she looks like after being patched. And this is the other patient who had the calcium spike, who we tried to patch and who wound up requiring surgery, and her MRI that was read as normal, and what she looks like after surgery to fix her leak. And this is a young woman who I didn't show you images of today with another MRI that was read as normal, and what she looks like after being patched and someone else whose MRI was read as being normal and what she looks like after being patched. And someone else whose MRI was read as normal and how she looks after being patched. And these are just the people that I've diagnosed in the last six months. People who walked in, people who I stumbled across, who undoubtedly were coming in front of me before my daughter got sick and I started reading about spinal fluid leaks. And now, now that I know what to look for, I'm finding these people and I'm patching them. And that means that they're not as rare as people think. And so you have to help me. You have to help me because those people whose pictures I just showed you were diagnosed with POTS and Chiari malformations and Ehlers-Danlos, which is a connective tissue problem, which is true, and Tarlov cysts and chronic migraine and chronic fatigue syndrome. And one came in and told me, I've got fibromyalgia. And one even had Parkinson's disease symptoms. We're not sure if the one who had Parkinson's disease symptoms is really leaking or not. We're gonna get to the bottom of that. Robert Kennedy said, it's not enough to understand or to see clearly the future will be shaped in the arena of human activity by those willing to commit their minds and their bodies to the task. And so I've committed my mind and body to the task of finding people who are leaking, looking for them where they may be hidden. And as part of that, I've reached out in the last six months to the Marfan Clinic here at Stanford. Marfan's disease is a disease where your connective tissue isn't quite so strong. And I've said to them, anybody who walks in who has a headache or who has chronic nausea, I want to see them and evaluate them for a leak. And I've called over to the POTS clinic and said, hey, anybody who comes in with POTS who has headache as part of their syndrome, I want to see them. And that's being fruitful. This person is someone who I called when I got her name from the POTS clinic, and I got it on a Saturday when I was babysitting my kid and I would brought her to the playground at the McDonald's. And I called her from the playground at McDonald's on a Saturday and I said, look, you don't know me and I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I think you don't really have what you've been diagnosed as having. I think maybe, just maybe, you have a spinal fluid leak. And sure enough, that's what she had. So if I can find these people, and so many so fast in just the last six months, I think if you're here and you're listening to this, or if you're watching this on YouTube, again, you either know someone who's leaking or you know someone who knows someone who's leaking. So I ask you to spread this message, and if you're watching this video, spread this video. And that's it. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Somebody who has a headache and um, they have trouble to get the Botox injections, do they have the risk to get puncture and bleeding? So the question was, if someone who's tall or maybe has other signs that their connective tissue isn't quite right and uh, they're getting Botox for headaches, are they at risk of having a dural puncture? We don't think so, because the dura is inside the skull, number one, and when they're doing the Botox injections, they should not be getting close to the dura. But the bigger question is, is is someone who's getting Botox for chronic headaches, who's tall, are their chronic headaches and their tallness related? Are they related by the fact that their connective tissue is different? Someone who's having chronic headaches, who's particularly tall, should be thinking about, well, you know, if I spend, if let's say they're getting headaches every day, you should have that person lie flat for a day and see if their normal 2 p.m. headache comes on. If they lie flat for a whole day and they find that it's the best day they've had in the last three or six months, they're leaking. You're welcome. Yeah, if somebody had a pons with white spots and uh, acromegalia that improved over time, could they have a spinal leak because of the pituitary? being large like that? So the question is, if someone had um, abnormalities seen on their pons, on the imaging, and uh, had acromegaly, mm -hmm. uh, could that be caused by a leak? The thought is that a spinal fluid leak and its effects on the pituitary should, if anything, cause levels of growth hormone to be a little bit lower, possibly. Um, so you would not expect acromegaly to come from a spinal fluid leak. We have seen other pituitary disorders. So we've seen the prolactin be high. We've seen people who were diagnosed with hypothyroidism, which is not so terribly uncommon, but um, we've seen people who had hypothyroidism that wasn't because they had the usual case, which is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but actually they're um, they were leaking, and when we patched them, their thyroid hormones started to come up. Is uh, feeling a, a tightness on your head or capping, uh, uh, is that ever a symptom? Many people describe the head pain as pressure or tightness or a vice-like uh, sensation. And again, if you or someone who's watching is wondering, could the sensation that I'm having in my head, I'm getting this pulling sensation in the back of my head. I'm getting a pressure sensation in the back of my head. I have a vice sensation. If it's worse late in the day, that's suspicious. Is it gone when you wake up in the morning? It's suspicious. If you spend a day lying flat, is it all but gone? Very, very suspicious. So one of the easy things, if you want to know, is this something worth pursuing? If you're having those kinds of symptoms, if you spend the day flat, are they gone? OK. Other questions? When you're talking about abnormal connective tissues, I have a friend who has an extreme case of cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And she gets headaches daily. Mm -hmm. Would the tightness of the muscles and connective tissue be a cause for a spinal leak? The, uh, the tightness of the muscles and the tissues would not be a cause for a spinal fluid leak. However, people who have cerebral palsy fall down a lot, and falling down can cause a leak. People who have cerebral palsy sometimes get lumbar punctures for diagnostic studies, so they have a needle stuck in them. That could be a reason for a leak. Uh, people who have cerebral palsy and it's severe often have had back surgery. And as we hear in the news about 
the coach of the Warriors, back surgery can cause a leak. So um, again, if you're seeing someone who's having headaches and they're there most days, and if it's gone when they wake up in the morning after they've been flat for eight hours, or if they lie down and it feels better after an hour of lying down, or if it's much worse late in the day, be suspicious and test it. It's easy to lie down flat for a day and see, are your symptoms largely gone? If you lie down flat for a day and it's the best day you've had in the last three months, then somebody should really be evaluating you. They should be doing the MRI, brain and full spine, and they should be doing the CT myelogram. The MRI that's read as normal, and if you take one thing away from all of these people whose MRIs were read as normal, don't be stopped by an MRI that's normal. If your symptoms are gone when you're flat, you need a CT myelogram. And when they're doing the CT myelogram, they should be measuring some of the fluid for the protein content. And if the protein content is high, you're on the right track. Or at least it's worth investigating seriously with someone who knows. And the doors here at Stanford are open. Catch is that um, how long does it last? Sometimes it can last a few months and then someone starts leaking again. Once they get past not having symptoms for a year, the thought is is their likelihood of recurrence is very low over the next 10 years. So when you patch someone, especially if their connective tissue is not right, the thought is, is um, that this is something that they're at risk for. But the truth is, let's say you had these symptoms and we patched you, and your symptoms went away for three months and then came back. Now we know what it is. Now we know what to do for it. That's a whole much easier kind of problem to deal with. You patch that, and you move on. And the truth is, is for most people, we think what happens is you patch the leaks, and then they do well for a number of years. And they slip on the stairs, they start leaking again. So. Well, uh, you recommend for testing those people who have headaches during the day to lay down. That lay down is with pillow or without pillow? You really, it's, the question is, uh, is referring to my uh, recommendation that people who wonder, could I have something like this? Yes, spend a day flat. And when I say flat, you really, it's best done without a pillow if you can tolerate it. People, we know people who have postdural puncture headaches, the thing where we cause it with a needle. Many of those people will say that even one pillow makes their symptom worse. So you really want to be flat. And if you're going to base decision making on it, you really want to give yourself the best trial. So you should really try and be flat. And you should try and be flat all day long. You pick a Saturday and you say, you know what? On Saturday, I'm going to listen to audiobooks on my iPhone, or I'm going to read a book, and I'm just going to stay flat all day. And I'm going to see, am I really experiencing that throbbing headache I always have at 4 PM? And if at 4 PM you feel just fine, there's a likelihood that there's a big problem, and you've got to start getting looked at for a leak. So now I need you to explain me, um, uh, how do you say? If you're standing, you leak, but if you are flat, you're, you're uh, So it's clear. How, how does it work? So let's say we're looking, um, I'm going to pull up an image to help explain this. This. So. Here's your normal spine, OK? And that bag of fluid that goes all the way up to the skull. You know the sensation when you dive into a swimming pool and you try and pick something off the floor of the swimming pool? How the pressure, you feel the pressure in your head as you go down and down. It gets more and more pressure. That's because you have a column of fluid up on top of you. Here, down here, low in the spine, when you're upright, the bottom part of your spine here and the thecal sac is seeing the same kind of pressure as if you were in a three-foot swimming pool. All right. So if there's a little hole or a little problem here, or you have something like this, 
If you have, um, do you remember the image I showed you where there was this big kind of dilation at the bottom of the fecal sac? Imagine you've got that. When you're standing upright, that's under a lot of pressure, and it's going to leak. When you're flat, there's no pressure because the column, instead of being three feet high, is now two inches high. So it really doesn't leak much. And that's why people don't have as much symptoms when they're flat. Thank you. When you say the doors are open, do you have uh, studies that people can enroll in? I mean, well, at this, point, at this point, we're not looking to do research. All right, so I've written, I don't know, 20, 25 papers. And I'm not sure that anybody has really read my papers or that it's really helped one of those people. What I know is the last time I gave a talk here on neuropathic pain, 3,000 people watched that video. And that's why I'm here today, is because I figure if I draw a circle around me that's maybe 20 miles in diameter, there's got to be, if I found you know, close to 26 people in the last six months looking for leaks, how many people are living within 20 miles of where we are right now who are leaking right now? I'm trying to get the message to them that I'm interested in helping them. Not to do a study so I can write a paper, so that I can help them be back at work and enjoying life again, right? So I'm doing things a little bit differently. Um, I'm not writing papers about this, at least not yet. I'm doing clinical care. And so it's not that there's a research study, it's that there's a clinical enterprise that is looking to help people who have this kind of fixable problem. And so I'm trying to find them. And that's what this is about today. I want to make a comment. I happen to be one of Dr. Carroll's colleagues. And the reason this is so important, what Dr. Carroll is doing, reaching out through YouTube, is because there's such a profound ignorance. And I was one of those people who was profoundly ignorant and actually skeptical when Dr. Carroll was started talking about this. And uh, most of your physicians, I don't care how brilliant you, they are. In fact, Dr. Carroll pointed out people who are world-class radiologists or some of my colleagues who also happen to be big pain doctors, but primary care physicians. So if there's such a profound ignorance and all these people who watch this YouTube may go to their local doctor and your doctor says, oh, Dr. Carroll is probably crazy. And that's why it's so important to reach out. I had a case recently that was sent to me by one of actually my professors who taught me at Stanford in the 70s. And myself and Dr. Carroll and this professor were all in the anesthesio anesthesiology department. And he's older than I am. And he did what put in what's called an intrathecal pump into a chronic pain patient's, where it's a, a pump that goes into the spinal fluid space that is supposed to give you opioids into that space to treat some chronic pain problem. It turned out it didn't work out that well, and that patient had it pulled out, and she had a lot of issues. And everybody was trying to blame the patient for these kind of bizarre symptoms that nobody could understand, because at some point this pump was pulled out, and she was sent to me just to manage some medications. And I wasn't convinced that she was making stuff up or weird even though it kind of was presented to me by a former professor who was, I thought was quite bright. And as I started thinking about it, I said, this lady has a leak somewhere. And I sent her to Dr. Carroll, and he can describe if he wants to what's been going on, but it's all heading in a very positive direction. So if I'm thinking all these people who are, we're Stanford doctors, we're, I'd say, at least above average in our experience and knowledge, don't get it. And I was skeptical about some of the things that Dr. Carroll was doing. And I'm beginning to think, like now, back to a lot of my patients who I've took care of with POTS that I never really was able to help them in any way. That's why it's so important. I think that Dr. Carroll's approach of I'm in clinical care, I'm reaching out because there are a lot of people out there. Because of the profound ignorance, it doesn't mean these doctors are stupid, but we just were not educated I've done hundreds of blood patches for the cases he described after epidurals that other people sort of put in the needle too far. And I said, God, that doesn't jive with that. But it turns out there's something really here. And I think that's why this whole thing is important. And I think his approach is novel. And had I not come to this lecture, I wouldn't have thought how important that is. Because it is. It may be the only way of reaching out, do you know somebody? Yes. Because nobody else will 
endorse yeah. that there's a real problem. I'm convinced that most doctors know enough about this problem, exactly enough about this problem, to incorrectly tell a patient you're not leaking because they're so familiar with that postdural puncture headache thing and they're so educated that the MRI is the end statement in diagnosis that when they think of it and they get the MRI and it's normal, they stop. And that then begs the question, well, hasn't somebody published that the MRI is not such a great tool for this? No. In fact, just the opposite. Because all of the studies that have looked at the sensitivity of MRI for finding this kind of thing were written by neurosurgeons who operate at tertiary care centers. You don't get to see those neurosurgeons and get treated for a leak unless your MRI shows a leak. And then they do a case series where they look back at their last 50 patients and they say, 90% of those patients had MRI evidence of a leak. Therefore, the MRI must find 90% of leaking cases. But that's circular. Cases where there's clear MRI evidence of a leak get to the neurosurgeon, who then writes the paper saying, all of my patients had MRI evidence of a leak. What about the people who were referred for a possible leak that they didn't see? because they didn't have any imaging evidence that they had an operable problem? Or what about the people who they saw but they didn't operate on because there was no MRI evidence of a leak, so they sent them home even though they said they had terrible pain when they stood up? It's circular and it begs the question. So if, if in fact an MRI is 90% successful at finding leaks when they're there, how is it that I've in six months found all these people who can be improved with a blood patch whose MRIs were read as negative. And their CT myelograms were read as not showing a leak, but almost all of them had something funny. Right? So they had this, or they had that, or they had that. It wasn't that all their imaging was stone cold normal. Their imaging showed things that you could think, yeah, I could see how that would leak, and showed things that people might even think were a leak. But their MRIs were normal. So I've either got to be the luckiest person in the world to find all these people with CTs with hard evidence of things that could cause leaks, who nonetheless have MRIs read by world-class radiologists that are normal. Like, if they're normal, if these radiologists are saying the MRI is normal, the MRI really is normal. It's not that they're not reading it correctly, it's that the, it really is normal. So either I'm the luckiest person in the world that keeps finding people who have positive CTs and can be fixed with an epidural blood patch, but their MRI's normal, or really MRI's not such a good test after all. And that's the first paper I hope to write about this, when we have enough people who we've fixed with epidural blood patches that we can look back and say, what percentage of people who are fixable could be detected with an epidural blood patch, excuse me, what percentage of people who are fixable could be detected with MRI? And that'll provide us with a very different number than looking back at the case series of people who I operated on for spinal fluid leaks, but I only operate on people with MRI evidence of spinal fluid leaks, right? Different ways of looking at the world. And if you believe that the MRI is a good test, and then you believe that only the people who have MRI evidence are leaking, then you can believe that this is an uncommon problem. And then you have to come up with some reason why everybody's getting better when we do epidural blood patches, but they didn't get better when they were given medicine, and they didn't get better when they were given joint injections or facet joint injections or Botox injections. It's not just that they're the best placebo responders in the world. They got lots of things that could have elicited a placebo response, but did nothing. They got epidural blood patches that caused them to get better and go back to work. One more thing which makes me think about it is that every now and then in my, I don't know, thousands of blood patches I may have done, there was a couple who never got well. What if they were one of these people 
just like the patient I sent you, all it took is that leak, and then all these other places start leaking. And maybe that's why those were the people who you know who had an epidural for a C-section, and they sort of never really got better after it. What, what Gabriel's referring to is a very interesting case that we have, which is, so a woman presented to him with very strange neurologic symptoms. She's saying that when she looks at, when she tries to read, she can't read because all the letters look like they're up and down. She's profoundly fatigued. She has terrible headache, terrible neck pain, but all kinds of neurologic weirdness too. And she had previously had an intrathecal pump that had been taken out. And Gabriel quite reasonably thought, maybe she's leaking from that pump. So she sent them to me and I looked at her and I couldn't explain some of her symptoms, but I thought, you know, when you're leaking, sometimes you have brain dysfunction and that can present in very strange ways. So, uh, but I said, you know what? Because 30 to 40% of people who are leaking are leaking, at least people who are leaking chronically, are leaking in more than one space. We did a CT myelogram on that patient. And what we found was she had profound aneurysmal dilations at multiple nerve roots, which raises the question, was the intrathecal pump put in, in part because she was having intractable neck pain and head pain and things like that? And he was thinking about a leak for the right reason, because of her symptoms and because she had a known incident, a known kind of trigger for causing a leak, but this may have been someone who was actually leaking even before the pump was put in. And that's when like things get really complicated. But uh, so what we found is that we don't have to just patch her where her pump was, we're patching her at other places and she's getting better. She's not yet fixed. That's why you don't see the picture of her with the thumbs up. I only get the picture with the thumbs up with people who are telling me that they're fixed. And in the interest of full disclosure, she recently reported some residual symptoms. But the proof is in the pudding that the patient got better. Yeah, the patients. And, and she's not crazy. Yeah. She is getting better. Yeah. And whether we fix her, you fix her or not, that blood patch that you did recently, and she comes in like a different human being, that's not placebo effect. Yeah. So. so. CT my myogram, sorry, is the new technology? And no, the CT myogram is old technology. Oh, really? And because it involves radiation, and because it involves a needle in the back, people are so afraid to do the CT myogram. You know what? The CT myogram shows those calcium things much better than the MRI. Because you're actually putting contrast into the spinal fluid, you have a much better chance of seeing kind of an aneurysm of the thecal sac. Because you're sticking a needle in there, you can really actually measure the spinal fluid pressure. And because you're getting some of that spinal fluid, you can look at it for elevated protein. It is the most underutilized test for people who are thinking, could I have a leak? Because we're so afraid to send someone to get a needle in their back one day when they're suffering every day. Thank you very much. For those people who are out there who are watching this a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, you can come find me at the Stanford Pain Management Center. And if you're 3,000 miles away or 6,000 miles away and you want to ask me a simple question, send me an email to ic38 at stanford.edu.